thank you very much for coming in to speak with us today, uh, Professor Colm, about Dr. Kathleen Lynn. Um, it's a pleasure. Could you give us um, a bit of background about Dr. Kathleen Lynn, about where she grew up, where she went to school, and where she did her medical education? She was born in North Mayo. Her father was a Church of Ireland clergyman. She then did her medicine in the College of Surgeons. And after that, she was in England for a short period and then came back to Dublin and was accepted in the Iandir, Royal Victoria Iandir Hospital in which she worked from 1901 uh, until 1916. And it, it becomes apparent why she didn't come back. She didn't come back because she wasn't acceptable to the management as it was at that time, because she did indicate that she was ready to take up her position again. It's recorded. And then, so she worked from 1901 to 1916. So she progressed through her training and through the specialty and through positions in the Ironeer? Yes, she didn't reach a senior position, but she got promoted two small steps in that 15 years. So she wasn't totally stable, if you like, at the lower rung, but she just went up a couple of rungs. Uh, and then obviously it terminated from that, otherwise she probably would have gone higher. But because she wasn't back, she couldn't do that. And was it difficult at the time for women to progress through the ranks? It probably was, and uh, given the attitude of the administrative people and of the culture at the time. Because she wasn't a Catholic for a start, she wasn't entirely acceptable. And women weren't, if you like, top of the pile in medicine either. So there were all of these things that came into it. And even though she was more progressive, in fact, than a lot of the men that were in it, uh, she still wasn't acceptable because she was female. And then so, while she was employed in the INDR hospital, she took part in two major political events. She was, had helped the poor during the 1913 lockout, am I correct? That's correct, quite correct. She and was in the Green. In the Green. And Markovic was there as well, wasn't Markovic she? Markovic was with her. She was very friendly with Countess Markovic. And they were both certainly in Stephen's Green uh, during that period. During that. And what sort of work would she have been doing in St Stephen's Green? Dishing out food, uh, feeding the poor and dealing with or guiding them with their ailments and remembering that the ailments would have been infections, particularly malnutrition and of course the TB. Now you couldn't make a diagnosis of TB in the middle of the green, but at the same time it would be fairly obvious to people that were used to seeing it, especially if they were bringing up bloodstained sputum, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's, that's what she was doing, feeding them and looking after their health as best she could with limited resources. And then during the 1916 rising, so um, Dr. Lynn played a part in that. Could you elaborate more on that for us? Yeah, she, she was very much involved in it. She was um, with uh, uh, two or three or four others that went, uh, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but they were small numbers, to take uh, Dublin castles. They were trying to put up a, the tricolour and he popped across the road to Dublin Castle, which was a daft thing to do in some ways because that was very well protected by the occupying forces. And he was shot, killed, trying to put up the tricolour. Then Kathleen, who was on the other side of the street, uh, and I'm not sure if there was anybody else with them. I'm sure there was, but I don't have the names. They retreated uh, and went away off and were subsequently arrested. Uh, and then after know. they were arrested, what they ended up in Mountjoy and Kilmainham, was it? They ended up in Kilmainham. That's where the, 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 the prisoners were brought in initially. And she was incarcerated upstairs, up one of the senior, top floors or upper, upper floors. And the execution yard was down below them. So they could hear everything that went on in the execution yard. And she was very friendly with Grace Gifford who was um, the, the fiancé of Joseph Mary Plunkett. And they 
they heard Joseph Mary Plunkett being shot down below because she heard those shots every morning when she was in her cell, when Connolly was shot, when all the others were shot down there. And she had to live through that and possibly, although it didn't come through much, but possibly would have had an effect on her for her life in some ways that made her uh, the independent lady that she was, not taking any nonsense. Well, after she was released from prison, what happened with her employment in the I and They There was, <clears throat> I have seen the minute, and the minute it goes as uh, the, something like this. Uh, would the Honorary Secretary note that we have received a correspondence, that's not the word they use, but something similar, uh, correspondence from Dr. Kathleen in, indicating that she uh, is available to come back to work. That would have been late 16 or maybe into mm -hmm. early 17. And at the subsequent meeting, there's a, a, a record to say, would the Honorary Secretary please tell Kathleen Lynn that her services are no longer required. So she was just fired out, no reasons given, although the reasons are very obvious, and no apology for same or no uh, platitude or no anything to make it slightly easier. So she was just kicked out, basically, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And when you look at her history, it was because she was involved with the Rising, with mm -hmm. the Republican movement, etc., which wasn't acceptable to the senior figures, or a lot of the senior figures, certainly, in the hospital at the time. And those of you that you know, have access to uh, sort of some of the records, will see that the senior figures were, were uh, Sir William Wilde, et cetera, et cetera. So they were uh, Lord Glenavy, and they were, cha they were chairs and secretaries of the uh, board up until the 40s. So it was only in about the 40s that there was a, so a, a, a cosmopolitan change mm -hmm. in, the, in the senior structure in the hospital. Now, the, I mentioned Kilmainham, but she was also in Mountjoy. Mm -hmm. They hated Mountjoy. It was filthy, full of rats and mice and all that sort of thing. It's recorded in, in her book. Uh, Kilmainham um, it, it was more acceptable in the sense that it was cleaner, but that's where the, all the executions took place, which must have been devastating psychologically. Can you imagine yourself? sitting upstairs listening to your friends being shot morning after morning. I think it was, they, they, they did one execution a day and the coup de grace then followed on with it. And the fact that she was so friendly with um, uh, Joseph Mary Plunkett's girlfriend made it even more difficult for her in that particular instance. But she was obviously very strong-willed because she was able to get over that. But she was then deported. It wasn't that she went on holidays or anything. She was actually deported to Wales uh, with Countess Markovich. They could both easily have been executed, but it, it, and there would have been a danger of that, but there would be a danger of it. And they, they, were, they were transported over to Wales, and then she came back a year later, or approximately. Markovich was still over there. But when she applied to the Eye and Deer Hospital, or indicated, indicated, in fact, that she was ready to take up her duties. And it, it is so recorded. The answer was, would the Honorary Secretary please tell Dr. Lynn that her services are no longer required? Full stop. And that was the end of her relationship with the Iandir Hospital. So then after that, she went on then to found St. Alton's Hospital. She did. It was a couple of years after that, that it actually 1919 or so. And she would have come back from Wales probably 1917. So there was a year or two there just in between, I suppose, while she was getting organised. And then she, and in, in, in that period of time or in or around that, she was elected as the TD, that would have been the Republican TD uh, for Ratmines, Ranala area. Now, she didn't ever become active in that. Uh, I read in one piece of literature that I saw that she didn't take up her seat, but she certainly wasn't active, whether she took up her seat or not, I'm not sure. But she, she wasn't active, so she didn't really ever get into politics after that, although she would have been a die-hard a Republican though, but she had done her bit, I suppose, and couldn't do very much more. I mean, she was at, she was at her maximum because she was lucky she wasn't shot. Um, 
And then what work was done in St. Ulton's? So that was a hospital she bought herself. That's right, yeah, herself and Madeleine French Mullen, who was a friend of hers for life. So, but the two of them then got organized up in Ulton's. Uh, and it was the central, it was the center for the BCG in Dublin. It was the main center once they got going. It wasn't one of the children, other children's hospitals. It was St. Ulton's that was the main. She also had a contact with Montessori, who came to see her in Dublin, and they opened a Montessori school in St. Ulton's, probably the first in this country, maybe the only one for a long time. And the children could avail of that free of charge up there. Not quite sure what a Montessori school teaches, but it's, it's, it's certainly topical in terms of education of children. So first Montessori school and the first BCG centre, the major BCG centre. Harcourt Street Hospital, which I think used to be called the National Children's Hospital. But anyway, a Harcourt Street Hospital refused to have any connection with her and refused to take uh, down any things that they felt they couldn't handle. Now, this attitude was supported again by the Catholic Church, and I don't want to keep stressing the Catholic Church, but it does, they did have a significant effect on Kathleen and on what she was trying to do. They certainly weren't helpful. They didn't support her at all in no, the running of St. Alton's? Not at all. And what sort of patients were St. Alton's seeing? They were seeing anybody. But it was by and large the poor of Dublin because th there were no charges. They just took them in. And then so she was really caring for the poorest of the poor in Dublin and the children of Dublin that the other hospitals weren't caring for. That's right, yes. And uh, some of the other hospitals, in fairness to them, were caring for them too. But uh, she, they seemed to be the only hospital that had the door open all the time for them and would admit without any query about anything, you know. Um, now, that means, of course, as well, that there was probably mixtures of infections meeting up, but, you know, it couldn't have it every way. And then they had lovely play facilities, and there are lovely photographs of them playing in creches, playing on little thingies that have wheels on them going around, and one of them sitting in, one of them pushing the other. And also Kathleen being part of the fracas that was going on with the kids playing. Some lovely photographs uh, of, of them. And, uh, and, and uh, she really got on the wavelength with them, and they seemed to accept her. And, and you know, she, she was marvellous. And as to hours of work, I have never, not been able to uh, pin that down, and whether she came in at nine and went home at four. I have a feeling she came in at eight and went home 24 hours later. That's the impression I get, that there was no question of. And then money didn't come into it because nobody was paying anything and she wasn't getting any grants from anywhere. So people were obviously ma making donations or whatever. It's the only way the hospital could have survived. And then what do you think or what do you believe is Dr. Lynn's legacy to people who work within eye care now and other women in medicine today? And she was an absolute inspiration and she was able to get over all of the hazards that were in front of her, including the bias against her because of her A, religious beliefs, and B, because of her political status. She, however, did nothing wrong at any time and was always supportive of the poor and of the needy and established a service and services that were not available in even the big hospitals. She'll never be forgotten and the more uh, she's mentioned the better in the sense of keeping in mind the sacrifices that she made. So one cannot but admire her for her resolutions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Colm. I think we can all agree that Dr. Kathleen Lynn has been a massive inspiration and continues to be. And we hope that her legacy will be remembered through the Dr. Kathleen Award that we'll give today.